Good morning, Peace Church, and welcome to worship. If you're joining us on YouTube this morning, click on the link in the description below to check in. If you're joining us on Facebook, that link can be found in the comments. No matter how you're joining us, we would love to know that you've worshiped with us this morning. You will also find other helpful links such as our online giving portal and prayer request submission. If you are still able, you can continue to send in any contributions through the mail or give electronically by visiting www.peacechurch.org give. If you know of someone that doesn't have access to a computer, we encourage you to call them and worship with them over the phone. We want to make sure that everyone is still connected during this time when we are urged to stay apart. Lastly, if we can be of any assistance during this time, please don't hesitate to contact the church office. From all of us here at Peace, thank you for joining us this morning. Now let's begin worship with the singing of our opening hymn. make our beginning this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Let us now take a moment of silent reflection. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most gracious God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen.
Our gospel lesson today comes to us from the gospel of Matthew in chapter 15. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you this morning from God our Father and from Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, many of you may not be aware of this, but I grew up in West Africa, uh, in Liberia to be exact. And growing up in Liberia, I grew up around a lot of Lebanese uh, people. This may sound strange because uh, Liberia is a West African nation, and uh, of course, there are Africans in Liberia predominantly. Uh, there are a lot of Africans, uh, but there are other nationalities in Liberia as well. As a matter of fact, uh, we have so many uh, Lebanese, the presence of Lebanese people in Liberia to the, to the degree that uh, the government of Liberia at some point uh, began to consider whether to extend citizenship or the right of citizenship uh, to the Lebanese uh, population. And this is because, uh, as a matter of fact, I was in Liberia a few years ago and I met, I was in an internet cafe because in Liberia, uh, it's not everyone doesn't have a uh, internet connection or a T1 or wireless connection in their home. So if you wanted to use uh, the internet, if you wanted to get online, uh, you would go to a specific place uh, in the city and you would go to uh, an internet cafe. So there are these places that are set up where you can go and for a certain price uh, you will pay and you will have a, a certain amount of time to browse or, or to surf the internet. Uh, I heard things have gotten a little better now because uh, this was back in 2004. Of course, this is 2020, and people can now purchase uh, time on these little USB uh, wireless cards, and they can uh, browse the internet from their own personal computer. But this was back in 2004 uh, when I visited Liberia after being in the US for some seven years. And I was in uh, this internet cafe, and while I was browsing, uh, I heard the door open and someone walked in, and I heard a voice from the back, and this person called my name. And he said, John, is that you? And I looked up and I looked back, and I didn't quite recognize, because it had been a while, I've been away from Liberia for some time. Uh, but then as I began to look just a little closer, I realized that the person calling my name was an old friend of mine by the name of Nick, Nicholas. And Nick was the son of uh, a Lebanese merchant and an African mother. So uh, Nick's father was from Lebanon, and he was a Lebanese merchant or a Lebanese businessman who had settled in Liberia some years ago. Uh, and he was part of the merchant class. As a matter of fact, uh, the Lebanese uh, merchant class in Liberia is actually the predominant uh, merchant class. They uh, own and run a lot of the local businesses uh, in the city and also in, in rural communities. The reason I bring this up is because if you know anything 
about Lebanese people. And even as, as I'm talking about this, I'm, uh, I'm thinking about uh, what happened in Lebanon only uh, a week ago and the, and the bomb uh, that went, went off in Beirut City. And I ask uh, that we continue to pray for the people of, of Lebanon and for those who are dealing with that tragic uh, situation. Um, but if you know anything about uh, Lebanese people, you, real, you will understand that they are some of the most uh, persistent and, and most tenacious uh, group of people you will ever come across. And I know this because uh, back in Liberia, uh, if you wanted to go, if you were going to the store, to any supermarket uh, to buy something, most likely every other store uh, will be owned or will be run by a Lebanese merchant. And one of the things I came to discover was not only uh, are Lebanese uh, people very uh, uh, tenacious and very insistent and, and very persistent. If, if a Lebanese person, and of, of course this is a generalization, but this is based on my experience. If a Lebanese person uh, wanted something or had something in mind uh, that they wanted to go after, very few things would stop them uh, from going after that thing. And uh, I, I bring this up and I, I remember this uh, because as we look at our text this morning in Matthew 15, 21 through 28, uh, Jesus encounters a Lebanese woman, okay? Uh, some of you may be asking, what does this have to do with the text? Or what does this have to do with uh, the scripture that is before us this morning? Um, but I find Ma the, the account here in Matthew 15, 21 to 28, to be uh, one of the most interesting and fascinating uh, biblical accounts. As a matter of fact, uh, if you were reading through the Gospel of Matthew and you came across this story, it's, it seemed like a really obscure and, and hidden story. If you're not careful, you will gloss over it or you will skip over it and you will be more inclined to go on to the next uh, story or to the next uh, account. Uh, you, you might get stuck where uh, Jesus is walking on water or he's feeding uh, 5,000, not including women and children. Uh, if you're not careful, you will skip right over this account, not realizing that this is perhaps one of the most important and one of the most fascinating accounts in all of the Gospel of Matthew. I said this because uh, as Jesus encounters this woman, the scripture says that she is a Syrophoenician woman. Now, a Syro, uh, just to give you a little bit of a backdrop uh, as far as what is happening before Jesus encounters this woman, uh, you have to understand that Jesus has begun his ministry. He's uh, been baptized in the Jordan River. He spent 40 days and nights in the wilderness where he's tempted uh, by the devil, where he's tempted by the enemy. And he passed all three tests. He comes out of the wilderness and he begins to preach. He begins to declare, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He picks up right where John the Baptist leaves off. And he continues to preach and his ministry begins and is in full swing. I mean, Jesus is traveling from town to town, from city to city, from village to village, and he's preaching and declaring the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is like this. Repent, because this is the time. This is the season. This is the era where the kingdom of God has been brought to you in earnest. And as Jesus is preaching, there is manifestation of power. Scripture tells us that he is healing the sick. He's raising the dead. He's on the mount. 
and he's declaring the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, and he's talking about what it means to, uh, uh, what repentance actually means, that uh, repentance and righteousness, after you've repented and you've been received into the kingdom of God, there is an obligation, a responsibility to live a righteous life, to live a life according to what he called the Beatitudes. And Jesus is, is dropping great nuggets of wisdom here, there, and he's declaring and raising, and great things are happening. In fact, at one point, Jesus calls his disciples, and he said, uh, I want you to experience something of what the kingdom of God is like. And I want you to experience what it means to to possess uh, Christ, what it means to be in Christ and to possess and to have access to the power that comes along with being in the presence of God. And so Jesus sends his disciples out two by two. He said, go into every village and into every town and take nothing to eat and take nothing to wear. And when you walk into a house, say unto them, peace be on to your household. And if they say peace back on to you and they receive you, he said, dwell in that place and minister to them. Heal the sick, cast out demons and declare the kingdom of God. And so the disciples go out and they experience this great power, this great outpouring of the power of God. And they come back and they say, Master, Jesus, even the demons are subject to us at the mention of your name. Even demons bow and, 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 and the blind eyes are open and the cripple, they walk. I mean, we saw great things. And he says to them, rejoice, rejoice, not because you see these things. He said, rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And so we see Jesus as his journey. But at some point, as the story goes on, uh, Jesus gets some bad news. And he gets news that Herod has assassinated or has beheaded his cousin, John the Baptist. It is against this backdrop of Jesus receiving uh, such a, a, a terrible news. While, while he's traveling and preaching and declaring the, the works of God and the kingdom of God and performing great miracles and doing great things in the name of the Father, he gets news that Herod, out of his jealousy and his egotism, has beheaded his cousin, John the Baptist. And Scripture tells us that Jesus retreats with his disciples. He retreats and he goes away into the mountains, into a quiet place, into a place of solitude because he's trying to be alone, to just get some rest. It's amazing to me, though, that uh, after Jesus receives bad news about his cousin, John the Baptist, being beheaded, his response. See, for many of us, uh, if I receive news like that, I don't know how I would react. But Scripture tells us that Jesus' responds to bad news is to heal the sick. Jesus responds to this bad news by raising the dead. Jesus responds to bad news by continuing to do the will of God. Now, Jesus expected that his cousin, John the Baptist, would be, would be taken off the scene. I'm not quite sure that he expected him to be beheaded in the way that he was beheaded. But you will recall that at some point when uh, John is, is baptizing, is getting ready uh, to baptize Jesus, and Jesus he sees Jesus coming afar. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And as Jesus comes close to him and, and Jesus says, uh, you need a baptize me. He said, no, you're the one who need to baptize me. I need to be baptized of you because I recognize who you are. I recognize that you are the Lamb of God. I recognize that you are the one who takes away the sins of the world. He said, and then Jesus says something to him that is interesting. He said, uh, John says something to his disciples that is interesting. He says, I must decrease 
and he must increase. But Jesus says at uh, the Jordan River, he says to John, he said, we need to fulfill all things. He said, we need to fulfill all things of Scripture. It's important that you baptize me. It's important that you announce me. It's important that you let the world know who I am. And so John baptizes Jesus, and, but John and Jesus both understand that there is coming a time where John will be taken off the scene, and his ministry had been fulfilled. His purpose had been fulfilled because he was called to prepare the way. God raised him up to prepare to the way and to announce the Messiah, to announce the arrival of the king, of the Messiah, the one who would take away the sins of the world. And John had fulfilled his purpose, and so he was thrown in prison uh, because Herod didn't want to hear what John had to say. John was a bold, uh, in-your-face preacher. And John pulled no punches. Oftentimes, uh, the Scripture tells us that uh, John will rebuke Herod and say, Herod, you're in the wrong for taking your brother's wife. Your brother Philip, uh, you, you assassinated your brother and you took his wife. This is evil. This is wrong in the sight of God. And John the Baptist had this love-hate relationship with Herod. Herod had this love-hate relationship with John the Baptist, but the Scripture tells us that oftentimes that Herod will call upon John for counsel. So it's, it's, it's apparent that perhaps Herod didn't intend to kill John the Baptist, but on a certain day, he invited uh, men into his chambers. He invited some of the leaders and, and some of the rulers uh, in his domain to come and celebrate with him. And while they were celebrating, the scripture tells us that the daughter of Herodias came in, his stepdaughter came in, and she danced, a kind of a dance. And as a result of that, Herod was so taken with her, and he said to her, he said, ask anything of me, even up to a half of my kingdom, and I will give it to you. What a rash decision. What poor judgment. And the scripture says that she went to her mother. Her mother, holding vendetta against John the Baptist, said, I tell you what we'll do. Go back to Herod and tell him that you want the head of John the Baptist on a charger. Of course, Herod, not wanting to disappoint his, his guest and being a man of great ego, he has to grant her her wish. It is against this backdrop that Jesus is now traveling and going from city to city, from place to place with his disciples, and he gets news that his cousin John has been beheaded. And Jesus, all he wants to do at this point, all he really wants to do is to retreat and to just rest and to just be in the presence of the Father. Because he's been healing, he's been working, he's been doing the work of the ministry, he's been preaching, he's been traveling for days at a time, he's been traveling over uh, the Sea of Galilee by boat, going from one village to another. And as he's trying to retreat, the scripture tells us that the people sense and find out where he is, and they come to him in mass, over 5,000 men. And Jesus moved by compassion. Because the scripture says that he, he realized that they were like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus moved with compassion, began to declare the works of God to them. He began to preach to them and began to, to talk to them about the kingdom of God and the mysteries of God. And at some point, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, it's evening time. And these people have been with us all day. As a matter of fact, they've been with us for a few days now. And they haven't eaten. And, and they're hungry. So what, what are we going to do? And you know the story. Uh, Jesus tells the disciples, he said, you give them something to eat. And the disciples find a boy with uh, uh, five loaves and two fishes, and a great miracle is performed. It's, uh, against all of this, uh, Jesus is simply trying to retreat. He's simply trying to rest. And, and so the scripture says that he tells his disciples, he said, let's go over uh, to the other side. Let's go over to the region over by Tyre and Sidon. Perhaps over there, not too many people 
will know me and, and know about me and, 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 and they won't come after me like they've come after me in these other places. And Jesus and his disciples go over to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And the scripture tells us that he enters into a certain place. And as soon as it enters, a woman, a certain woman, a Canaanite woman, approaches the disciples and she says, my daughter, my daughter is possessed with a devil. My child is vexed with a demon. And I need to talk to the master. I need to talk to Jesus. At this point, of course, the, the text doesn't give us a lot of background as to how this lady's daughter became this way. The text doesn't tell us uh, which one of the disciples she approached first and, and the encounter and the interaction between her and the disciples. But it's clear that the disciples are irritated. They're irritated. And they say to Jesus, why don't you just send her away? She's irritating us. She's vexing us. She is persistent. Now, as, as I said earlier, uh, I find this text to be very interesting because Jesus said something to the Canaanite woman, to the Syrophoenician woman, that at first look, it seems as though he's being a little bit curt or perhaps even rude. What is happening here? This lady comes to Jesus and she says, Scripture says she falls on her knees and she worships him. She begins to plead with him for mercy. And she says something that catches Jesus' attention. She said, Lord, son of David, have mercy upon me. This catches Jesus' attention because this is not only a Gentile woman, not only is she a Canaanite and a woman, she's not one of the disciples of Jesus. And you will notice that all through the Gospel of Matthew or through the entire Gospel, the only people that refer to Jesus as Lord are his disciples. But this lady comes to Jesus and she calls him Lord. Not only does she call him Lord, she recognizes something about Jesus that very few recognize. She said, I know who you are. You are the son of David. You are the Messiah. You are the promised one of Israel. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You are Savior. You are Healer. You are Deliverer. I know who you are. You are the Son of David. You are the one. And Jesus says to his disciples, he says, Doesn't this woman know that I've come for the house of Israel? That I've come to fulfill the will of God? And my purpose, my purpose is to bring in the flock, is to bring in the house, those who belong to God. And disciples said, what, what do you want us to do, Master? Should we, should we send her away? They're, they're already a little bit dismissive. They're already a little bit curt, a little bit probably exhausted. Because they've been traveling and walking with Jesus all of this time. And they too want to rest. They too are tired. But this lady is persistent. Jesus says to her, he said, do you want me? Because she's asking for healing. She says, my daughter needs healing. My child is vexed with a devil. And I desperately need your help. And Jesus says, he said, I'm not going to take what belongs to the children and give it to the dogs. <laughs> so do you want me to take the children's bread and give it to dogs? Now, if you don't understand uh, anything about Lebanese people, 
you wouldn't understand this lady's reaction. Because I know that for many of you who are listening this morning and who are watching this morning, if Jesus has said that to you, if he, because basically he's calling her a dog. And it sounds degrading. It sounds as if it's a put down. And any of us, any other person would have said, I mean, now come on, Jesus. You know, I know that I need this healing. I need this deliverance. But you don't, you don't have to talk to me like that. <laughs> any other person would have probably caught an attitude. Would have probably thrown their hands up and said, I can't believe the, the would-be Messiah, the one, the rabbi, the one who they've been talking about, who takes away the sins of the world, the, the master, the Lord, will talk to me like this. And many of us would have caught an attitude. But this woman, true to her nature, as a persistent person, because you see, uh, the Phoenicians, uh, she was a Syrophoenician woman, which means she was born in Syria in the region of Phoenicia. And the Lebanese people are descendants of the Phoenicians. Uh, history tells us that the Phoenicians were great merchants. They were great seafarers. They traversed the great seas. They were uh, renowned merchants. Even to this day, all over the world. I was talking to someone not too long ago, and they said to me, they said, if you, they said there, there are three people in the world. The three people in the world. There's Nigerians, there's Lebanese, and there's everybody else. <laughs> and I found it interesting, and I said, what do you mean by that? You know, I've heard it said there are two people in the world. There are Nigerians, and there's everybody else. They said, no, there's, there's three people. There's Nigerian, Lebanese, and everybody else. And, and the reason I, we say this is, uh, think about it. There's, if you go anywhere in the world, you can go to the most remote corner of the world, and there are two people you, 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 you're most like. If you don't see anybody else, any other human being, you might find a Nigerian and you might find a Lebanese. And the reason I say this is because the Lebanese, they're adventurous people. They're merchants. They, would do, they do whatever it takes to get what they want. It's in their nature. This is, this is an ancient uh, character trait of the Lebanese people. They're great merchants. They will go to faraway places seeking business opportunity, getting things done, and making it happen. So any other person without... Uh, that background and that character would have probably taken offense. But this lady, she's probably used to being talked down to. She's, she's probably used to uh, being dismissed. And, but there's something within her. There's something about her character that makes her very persistent. She wouldn't take no for an answer. And so she's able, three things we learn as we uh, look at this passage before us this morning. The first thing is that the text doesn't answer a lot of our speculations. It doesn't answer a lot of our questions about what's going on with this lady emotionally and what's going on with the disciples and what's going on. Everything else is left to speculation. But what the text does do is... It answers the question, what does great faith look like? Because if you know anything about Jesus, it's not very often that Jesus is impressed by the people around him. Jesus is not very impressed by those that are following him, uh, nor by his disciples. But after his interaction, his encounter with this Syrophoenician woman, with this Canaanite woman, Scripture tells us, that he looks around at his disciples and he said, I've never seen such great faith. He said, what great faith? That this woman, 
after I've said all these things to her. Because you see, Jesus was probably only testing her. He was testing to see where her belief really was. He was testing her to see where her faith really was. There are a lot of times that you and I may come to God, and we may come to Jesus, and we may ask of him, and we may say, Lord, I need you to do something in my life. I need you to turn things around. I need you to heal. I need you to deliver. I need you to bring my wayward child back home. I'm dealing with this sickness or this disease. I'm dealing with this thing. And it seems as if Jesus doesn't answer you. It seems as if he's being dismissive. It seems as if he's ignoring you. But sometimes it's only a test. And the three lessons we learn from this passage of Scripture. Number one, what does great faith look like? The anatomy of great faith. This is a master class. Matthew 15, 21 to 28. Here Jesus gives us a master class in great faith. What is great faith like? What does it look like? Say, if you want to see, if you want to know what great faith looks like, look at the faith of this woman. Number one, she had perspective. When Jesus approached her, when she approached Jesus, and Jesus said these things back to her, which was only a test, she didn't catch an attitude because she knew what she wanted. She knew what she was going after. It was in her nature to be persistent. It was in her nature to never give up, to go after what she wanted and not take no for an answer. And so she said, well, master, even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She had a perspective on who Jesus was. She knew that he was Lord. She knew that he was the son of David. She knew that he was the master, the creator of all things, the master of the universe. And if anybody had the power to turn around her situation, if anybody had the power to turn things around, Jesus surely had the power to turn things around. And so she had perspective. She was able to look at everything that was going on and put it in perspective to what and who Jesus was. Number two, this lady showed humility. Like I said earlier, any one of us would have caught an attitude. I mean, come on. I know I need this healing. I know I need this thing from you, Lord, but you don't, you don't got to talk to me like that. You know? It's like, why you, why you got to be rude? Why you got to insult me? I mean, come on. Anybody else? perhaps would have caught an attitude, but not the Syrophoenician woman, not this Canaanite woman. She knew she was already behind the curveball. She knew she already had three strikes. Number one, she was a woman. Number two, she was a Gentile. And number three, she was Syrophoenician. She was outside of the house of Israel. She was outside of the commonwealth of Israel. She knew she didn't deserve any of what she was asking for. And she said, Lord, you don't even have to give me a full course meal. If you just give me the crumbs that fall from the master's table, I will settle for the crumbs. Number three, this lady knew that Jesus had the answer, and she was willing to pursue him relentlessly. And I'm going to close right here. If there's anything I could close with today, I'd like to say to you, how bad do you want it? You see, I know sometimes with our Lutheran theology, uh, dogmatically, we talk about faith. And faith for us is the gift of God. It's not something that we necessarily have or we necessarily uh, possess or own. This is faith is the gift of God. Faith is conferred. Faith is something that God confers upon us. And, and that's okay. And I, and I get that. And I agree with that. But why is it that God will allow this obscure 
story about this Canaanite woman's faith to be left right here in the scripture, to be left right here in the middle of the gospel of Matthew. Because he's trying to teach us another lesson. He's trying to show us that sometimes when it comes to faith, you have to be relentless. Sometimes when it comes to faith, yes, faith is a gift of God. Yes, faith is something that he confers upon you. But my question to you this morning is how bad do you want it? How bad do you really want it? Hebrews 6 tells us, that without faith, it is impossible. So he that comes to God must first believe that he is, and he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. So what kind of faith is the scripture talking about here? What kind of faith is Jesus trying to teach us about here? Matthew simply calls it, great faith. He says, he looks at the lady and he says to those around him, what great faith. And sometimes that's what you need in order to get to that thing, to that next level, to that answer that you know that God has already secured for you. It's not a matter of whether or not he wants to do it. It's not a matter of whether or not he has the answer. Sometimes it's only a test. He wants to see where your faith lies. He wants to know how bad do you really want it. And so this morning, as I close, I say to you that this lady is in the league with some of the greatest faith heroes that the scripture has ever talked about. She's in the league with what the book of Hebrews called a cloud of great witnesses. There's examples of faith, of great faith, example after example of people who exercised their faith, who connected their faith with Jesus, who understood that he had done this for them, this great work of salvation, this great work, this great miracle that he wrought on the cross of Calvary was done for them. And by faith, they're able to be a partaker of the benefits that come from what our Christ has done. But my personal favorite out of all of the faith accounts is a man by the name of Enoch. The scripture, as you read in Hebrews, what we call the hall of faith, it says, Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for he was taken. After it gives us all the great examples of faith of men who shut the mouths of lions and, and, and did great things. And it talks about Gideon and, 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 and people who preach and, and told the sun to stand still and it stood still. And after telling us all these great things, it tells us there's a, there's a woman, an obscure woman. Who name it doesn't even give us. It simply says, she's the Syro. Mark calls her the Syrophoenician woman. Matthew calls her a Canaanite woman. And Jesus says, what great faith. How desperate are you? How bad do you want it? Do you want it bad enough that you're ready and prepared to dismiss and to ignore all the things that may seem negative, all the negative things? Are you willing to shut out all the naysayers and, and what people will say and, and, and what the haters have to say? Are you, do you want it bad enough that you're prepared to pursue Jesus and to receive what he has for you? Because at the end of the day, Jesus walks with us all the way to Calvary, and he walks with us even now. Amen. We confess our faith now together.
in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Join me this morning as we pray for the church and for the whole people of God everywhere. Most gracious and everlasting Father, Alpha and Omega, the one who was and who is and who is to come, the God who neither sleeps nor slumber, have mercy upon us, O God, and blot out our transgressions. According to your steadfast love, wash us of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. When our heart is overwhelmed, lead us to the rock that is higher than us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With contrite hearts and broken spirits, we come to you this morning, O God, pleading for peace comfort and healing for all who are sick and afflicted in our midst. Even as your word declares that healing is the children's bread, we say this day, give us our daily bread and remember us in our season of affliction. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As it is no secret that as a nation, as a people, as a church and as a family, we are faced with some of the most trying and uncertain times our world has ever seen. We pray for wisdom, for understanding, for tolerance, and for reconciliation in this hour, Lord. Even as we are concerned about safety and order and peaceful coexistence, I pray that you cause us, the church, the ambassadors of Christ in the earth, to be equally as concerned about justice, about equality, and about righteousness. Break our hearts for the things that break your hearts. Break our hearts for the things that break yours. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Once again, we present our families to you, Lord Jesus. Keep them, protect them, and deliver them from all evil, seen and unseen. We cancel every evil assignment and uproot every demonic entrapment the enemy has designed for our children and our loved ones. We lift up our country, our leaders, our military and police, our first responders, and all those on the front lines of protecting and securing our well-being. Remember them, O oh God, and let there be a prodigious outpouring of your grace, mercy, peace, love, and protection upon them all. May they feel you nearer to them every hour of every day, in every way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In closing, Lord, we lift up Peace Church, your people, 
your congregation, as well as the, as the church universal. May we be known for our love for God and our neighbor. May we embrace your call for our lives and learn to walk upright before you, showing mercy, loving justice, reflecting your great love, and spreading the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now hear these words from Jude. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.